Uh, if, if, if you study calculus before, you, you remember that if you want to find the minimal value of a function as one point that and you set derivative to be zero and you look for the rules, then you found the minimum solution. Now suppose now you have two functions, like this is f1 and f2, and I want you to minimize both of them at the same time. And usually those functions uh, do not necessarily share the same minimum, like these two examples here. And actually there are many other practical examples. Like if you are trying to build a, a say the app thing, for example, you want it for uh, any products, if you work for industry, you always want to cut down the cost. You want to spend as little money as possible on certain material. But you want to have the best quality you can have with the minimum uh, cost. Those two factors usually are conflict, right? If you don't spend much money, then your quality will go down. If you have very high quality, like a German car, I say it becomes very expensive. So those two are conflicting objectives. But uh, as a manager in the company, you have to compromise both of them. You have to decide to find the optimal solution for both of them. The minimum cost, the slowest you can get, and the best quality is as fast as as good as you can get. So, so in practice, there are many objective functions. They, they actually are opposite to each other, but you have to meet all of them. Okay. So this is a, this is a very simple mathematical example which shows that two functions have different minimum values. How do you minimize both of them at the same time? And the definition of the optimal solution here is actually illustrated here in this region. The two functions um, have this very interesting property. If you pick any point here, you move away from it, the result is that one function will go up, the other will go down. Okay? If you found that region and the objective functions have that property, any time you move around, one go up, one go down, or multiple going up, multiple going down. And that defines the so-called the, the Pareto solution or Pareto optimal solution. So in this uh, simple functional example, this region is, is where the two functions act opposite to each other. If one goes up, the other must go down. Any point you move around, outside this region, uh, then the functions will either go up together or go down together. Then the optimal is not there. Okay, that's a, that's a very famous concept of Pareto's that. Uh, Pareto is an Italian math and economist. And then if you plot the same function values uh, in, the, in the function objective space, you, you plot F1 versus F2, and you have uh, this uh, finite segment of a curve. And that's called the Pareto problem. Essentially, it's the, it's the image of this uh, curve projecting to F1, F2 thing. So those are the things we are looking for in multi-objective organization problems. So the message here, and then you need to remember for multi-objective organization problem is that the solution is no longer a point, usually it's a set. If the dimension is very high, like my problem here is the one dimensional example. It's a multi-dimensional design. It's Usually it's manifold, some strange curve or, or surface. And, and then also the, the Pareto front is also a manifold. Uh, also, in, if the dimension of F is n, so that manifold usually is n minus 1 dimension manifold. So the, uh, the problem I show here is a relatively easy one. And there's only one segment of the solution, so there's one continuous manifold. So there are many linear problems which we'll show you later on. You actually have multiple disjoint sets, and that makes finding the solution really hard. Okay, so that's what the uh, what we call MOP is about. So multi-objective optimization problem. So there are many mathematical issues with this. So one of the family of methods for the evolutionary algorithm. I, I like to use just a generic algorithm, okay? Uh, it's essentially a class of algorithm that try to 
mediated biological processes and then searching for optimal solutions in, in very high dimensional spaces. Uh, so, so the boundary is good points of the generic algorithm or any other evolutionary algorithm are really like this. Uh, they are very good for high dimensional problems because you don't have any constraints. The, the, the way it works is you just sum for points randomly in the space and it doesn't matter what the dimension of the space is. Uh, the method is the same if you do the program is for one dimension versus a hundred dimension. The algorithm doesn't change. Uh, of course, the complexity of the solution itself changes, but the algorithm itself doesn't. Okay. Uh, uh, then it has another very interesting property. It actually initially converges very fast. So, uh, I'll come back to that later. Then there is a lot of literature out there, including some excellent books written by Koala Koala. Uh, so, that, uh, some very nice papers, books out there. And also, there are many, many algorithms to implement different versions of generic algorithms or also known as an evolutionary method. There are many okay, different variations. Now, uh, generic algorithm uh, uh, essentially is a random search approach. Okay, what it does that in, in, in say, in a dimensional space, it samples, say, a thousand or two thousand points. And then it start evaluating uh, the objective functions for those one thousand, two thousand points. Then it's doing the comparison, okay? Then it's throwing some probability uh, that will keep some points and then throw away some points. There's a random selection process, okay? It is, they call this uh, the gene uh, crossover or mutation and then so forth. All those similarly biologic processes are really written uh, in the mathematical language just like random search. It's just a thousand point that generates another thousand point they call the next generation. And there are certain rules building in the evolution process. Uh, evolution process does not always select like the best one. Okay, and if you do that, then all the, all the populations eventually look the same. Okay, that, so there are certain rules programming those algorithm to keep diversity so that you have boys and girls, tall people, short people. Uh, so you have different versions of, even though you, with the same family, you will see that uh, the evolution of the family members, they don't look the same. As for the gene, in this evolution process, there's a, there's a diversity element in it. And that actually is programmed in, in many of those algorithms. Diversity somehow actually is, is doing something not so good for mathematical problems. The one of the problems that it causes is that it actually causes the slowdown of convergence. When, when all the points somehow migrate toward the parallel set for the optimal solution, and then because of diversity says you should not keep everybody the same. Because once you are on the solution, everybody look the same is the right choice. Okay? But then the diversity pushes some points away. So it actually slows down the convergence once all the points somehow migrate to what they choose solution. Uh, another uh, drawback of generic algorithm is that it, it does not necessarily guarantee global solution as because it's random. If it randomly select many points in the space, it may or may not be the, the branch of the solution. That's important. Okay, so there's really no guarantee. And the, old, the only way you can, you can, you can guarantee your, uh, the coverage of a global solution is that you repeat your, your, uh, your numerical simulations many times. And you start counting the convergence of the clusters. Okay, evolution approach usually will generate many clusters of points in the design space. If the number of clusters converges, and that more or less tells you there are no more branches of the solutions uh, that, that may be missing. Okay. Again, generic algorithm is very powerful. Uh, there are so many packages out there. Even MATLAB has a generic algorithm core that implements the best uh, generic algorithm that is in the literature. 
So if you ever want to do experiments with generic algorithms searching for, say, a minimum or a long linear function using GA is, is really fast. And for simple problems, uh, it's very efficient. For high dimensional problems, or for extremely complicated problems, then, then this math may have some limitations, mostly related to what I say here as certain randomness here. So, so you may not cover the solution uniformly, that's pretty random. And you may miss some branches because there's no guarantee for global solution. And also the convergence onto the solution may not be as fast as you wish. Okay. But otherwise it's really good. Yeah. So in another world, for the long linear dynamics, there's another class of methods. This actually are the methods that I've been working with since my PhD studies. It's called the Sam Mapping method. Now the original Sam Mapping method is trying to do this. Suppose you have a long linear differential equation and you are trying to understand the dynamics of the system. So as t goes to infinity, what does the solution look like? If there are many, many different types of solutions that we know now. There are chaos, there are periodic motions, mini cycle or fixed points, different like attractors, there are many different types of attractors. So traditionally, uh, Many years ago, people just simply take an initial condition and integrate. And then you integrate for a long, long time until it converges. Then you analyze the, the flexion points as t goes infinity and see what kind of topology you find. If it's a limit cycle, or it's a scanty attractor, or it's a fixed point. Okay? So, so that's a very classical way to do it. Because long linear systems typically. Uh, depends on the initial conditions. So if the system has multiple steady state solutions, like chaotic motion, periodic motion, or fixed point, if they all coexist, then every time you keep an initial condition, uh, you only see one solution. And you don't really know if there are other solutions in the state space. So another idea of doing uh, uh, long linear analysis is to do this. Instead of integrating for a long, long time, I'm going to integrate for a short time, and typically just one period of the, of the excitation. Okay, if, if we have a t here, if the function dependence is like sine, cosine, kind of thing, and you only integrate one period, and I keep an initial condition, I integrate one period, and then, now I do another thing, I'm going to discretize the space Okay, just creating many boxes, and I, I keep a, an initial condition for each box. I integrate only one period. Then I do this for all the boxes. So instead of have a very long history of responses, I have a short one, but I have many things. Okay, I collect many, many short trajectories. And using the modern terminology, this this trajectories from this array of initial conditions actually form a database. If you are a computer guy, you have appreciated this. If you have a database of the dynamics in this whole domain, in other words, if you tell me any box, I can tell you the next step, this box you are being in. Okay? And it turns out that if you have this kind of information for all the boxes, you can actually discover all possible steady state solutions, including chaos, limit cycle, a fixed points, saddle points, domains of attraction and the boundaries, and so forth. So many long linear features of the system can be discovered just by working on the database without further numerical integration. If this is the concept of the Sarah method, which was started with a at the end of the 1970s, early 1980s, when I joined my advisor in Berkeley. So we're trying to understand the global long linear dynamics. When you have a long linear system, what kind of static state solution you may have, and how many found them. So this is the idea. And it's called a simple static method. If you only take one point, 
initial condition in the box and only collect one image for, for one box. So one image, uh, one box is called a simple cell mapping. Uh, of course, uh, I'm drawing a very large box here, so you can you can comment on, on on the error of this thing, right? Because you're going to have errors here if the box is too big. Now, uh, but it is very efficient for global analysis, meaning that you can really find out everything in the domain. What all possible uh, steady state, stable, unstable solutions. So this does have a, a issue of accuracy, but it, one box to another box is, of course, not quite accurate. Uh, and then we have this so called the generalized uh, mapping. Essentially, we recognize the fact that if you take many initial conditions from the box, usually the points were not only in one box, it was spread out in some area. Uh, that you can imagine that if you, if you sample a certain area as initial conditions, then, then do the numerical integration one period, and usually all the points will cover a certain area, not just one box anymore. So then, then you allow each box to have a multiple image cells, and then the dynamics spread away from in this state space from one box to another box uh, becomes what's known as a mark of chain. This actually is the body of mathematical theory in statistics. It actually describes nonlinear dynamics very beautiful. Okay, uh, with the with the generalized cell mapping, there are many interesting concepts borrowed from Markov chains that you can describe really complicated longitudinal dynamics. Okay, so there are many ways you can do the computing of cell mapping. Now, now I'm trying to go back. So we're going to start out with uh, uh, with a multi-objective multi optimization problem, the MOP. Uh, this has nothing to do with non-linear dynamics, right? And uh, now I'm going to go back to the cell mapping uh, and try to relate the cell mapping to, to MOPs, uh, what you are really trying to do. So suppose then uh, this space is actually a design space. Okay, you are trying to Found the Fredo set, the optimal solution set in that space, and then you can evaluate all the objective functions at the center of each box, right? So you then form a database on that grid. So you have say, many, many function evaluation. But usually we don't do that way, just to give an intuition how, how the cell mapping is related to uh, MOPs. Suppose you do that. Okay, and then you have a database uh, of all function values. Then you can do a number of things once you have the database. One thing, for example, you can use the neighboring points or even additional points inside bars to do the gradient estimate of all the objective functions. Okay, with the gradient estimate, then you will tell you if you are here in the design space, the next point you should go to with lower objective objective functions would be, say, somewhere in the neighborhood, say, for, for example, could be coming to here. So if, if we found this point has objective values all less than the objective functions in this box, then we say we actually establish the dynamics from this point to this point. Okay. In other words, the dynamics uh, in the cell mapping now is coming from search actors. So, you, so imagine you are doing a gradient, so the gradient simply tells you to go downstairs a few steps, right? So you keep the, the number of steps you decide to go down, and you estimate gradient. So that becomes essentially uh, a discrete dynamics like this, and it, it is really a simple cell mapping, has the same mathematical structure as a, a step for non-linear dynamics, okay? Uh, you don't have to do gradients. So there are another search algorithm that tells you if you are in this box, the next box where you should go. So this is a very typical uh, search approach for minimums of functions. Okay? Even for single objective function of my basic problem, if I give you a random function, I want you to find the minimum value of that function in some, in some domain. 
All you can do is that you evaluate the function at a few points, and you estimate when to go down. Then you go down. Okay, then from one point to another, you're going down one step. That becomes a mapping. If you only have one image, then it's called simple step mapping. Okay? So now imagine that you actually accumulate this information for all the boxes. Okay? No matter where you are, you know where you should go next. Okay, using whatever search algorithm you have. Just going down stairs, no matter where you are. So if you have that information as a database, you can actually discover the global picture of the, of the Predator set, the optimal solution set. So that's very similar to how you get dynamics. Okay, you do the integration over a short time, you collect many boxes, uh, and then you form the database, then you found out the global picture of the state state solution. So the idea is that becomes the same, uh, both in for the nonlinear dynamics analysis and MOP search for optimal solutions. This is how we uh, connect these two things together. So now we said uh, the generic algorithm actually is pretty good. Uh, uh, it, the only problem is it, it's kind of random and, and it converges a little slower as it approaches the gradual set. Uh, so the same mapping methods, let me just uh, summarize the methods in terms of the optimization problem, okay? Uh, you, you, you notice that I keep saying that you can collect all the, the information from all the boxes and form a database. That's really the sweeping approach. Okay? So you have to sweep over the whole design space, therefore you can obtain the global solution of a Pareto set. So that's what Sam Hatton can do. Okay? Uh, and then it's actually pretty good, this method is very good for parallel processing. And at the end of the talk, I'll show you one example and, and quite a few parallel processing examples that can do uh, MOP solution searches in very high dimension, very fast. Okay, so it's very good for parallel processing, but it's not random because we are doing this structured, like solidless space search. So, so nothing is random. It is very deterministic. And as a result, we can actually discover very clear patterns uh, of a gradual set. I will show you that. Now, the, the disadvantage of the mapping method is that they actually, because we are doing the sweeping in the design space, and design space can be hundreds of them. So we have to, I'm going to show you a, a, a 13 dimensional space example later. But once you do the sweeping, and then the computation effort becomes very high, particularly for high dimensional spaces. And um, uh, then you do have specialization errors, right? You can have a finite size of boxes. So we can address that issue with so-called subdivision method. Okay, now we try to uh, marry the two methods together and form the so-called hybrid method. The idea here is this. We actually start out with a generic algorithm or any other evolutionary algorithm, uh, even in very high dimensional space, for example. We only take, say, a few thousand points in the population and we do this mutation crossover stuff for the generic algorithm. And we iterate a few generations. It doesn't have to be many generations, because if you do many generations, most of the points are clustered around the parameter set. Right? Although it's not accurate, but they're all there. So we, we only require a generic algorithm to generate some rough solutions. Uh, the best outcome is that it identifies the correct number of clusters. That's good enough for us. And then, then we, we start a simple set mapping method. We take a set of cells, the boxes, that contains all the generic algorithm uh, results. So generic algorithm, remember, gives you a random collection of points. Now we're going to use a box to contain them. Okay, there will be a finite number of boxes that contain all the generic solutions. Okay, then we start a so-called labeled recovery search algorithm. This actually is, is the core of this study. Okay, uh, that, that recovery search is, is 
very encouraging. We're still writing the detailed algorithm right now and putting the paper. Okay, then we, we essentially can converge to some set of private solutions. Now, with a bigger box or small box, it's up to you. If you use a big box, you can then use so-called subdivision for refinement. You can then uh, focus or zoom into a sub-region where you have identified a cradle set. Then you have a smaller boxes in that area. Then eventually you have very accurate, very accurate cradle set. So that is a step is called subdivision for refinement. <laughs> this actually was created by uh, by the professors and, and his students. That's Oliver Schultz advisors group. Okay, uh, I think the, the name of so-called set oriented method is essentially the semantic method with subdivision. Okay. Well, the main features of, of this hybrid algorithm is that we actually try to take advantage of both GA and SCM, both generic algorithm and semantic method. Because this generic algorithm very quickly outlines certain area you should focus to do the detailed search. But it's not good to do detailed search by the GA itself because random nature is doing the dancing a lot. If you do the simulation, you have found out the populations in typical evolutionary algorithm tend to bouncing around. That's the nature of the algorithm. It has to bounce. Otherwise, then all the points will look the same and everybody look has the same face, whether it's Chinese or Mexican. That's not good. So the diversity has to be in the biological process when we evolve. Okay? Uh, that's why there are so many different races, different looks in the world. Diversity is in the gene, okay? Uh, so, so that's the advantage of GA, and then we, we must know the detail, uh, the big region will do the detailed search with, with the neighborhood recovery algorithm. <laughs> and then this is actually pretty good for, for high dimensional problems, okay? Uh, our hybrid method, now as you can see, it actually carries the advantage of both GA and SCA. Okay, and then we have, we're going to show you some examples. And, uh, the combined approach always does better than the approaches applied separately. Okay, so this is the outline of the algorithm. So essentially, what we do, we start out with a generic algorithm or evolutionary algorithm first. Okay, uh, this doesn't have to be very high accuracy. It doesn't matter how many dimensions you have in your problem. But if you can just take a few thousand of points and a few uh, generations, and then if you, you got the rough solution and you generate the covering cells, this is just geometrical manipulation. Now we implement the simple cell mapping, which we call the modified simple cell mapping. It's very different from a traditional dynamic analysis, so it's, it's modified. So if you can have this local recovery search, then, then we ask the question, is the accuracy good enough? Okay? Uh, we want to do the refinement. If, if yes, then you do the subdivision, otherwise then you stop. So that's the, that essentially is the algorithm we have. Now here is the so called modified self-mapping algorithm. Essentially, this part is doing the local neighborhood recovery algorithm. Okay. So you decide, because we discard the space, then it's a lot easier for us to discover the neighboring behavior. Okay, but box by box. Uh, so it's very efficient. But this part that we're, we're implementing this part actually in parallel now, in parallel computing. So that's the algorithm itself. But this is a illustrated problem, uh, uh, example here. This is a very simple example. You have two circles, okay? Uh, one centered at zero, and the other is centered at five and five. This is the design space. We're trying to minimize the radius of both circles. And it turns out the, the Prado's optimal set is, is the line between the two centers. So this is, this is a very, Smart the construction of a simple MOP. Uh, this is one of the benchmark problems for test accuracy. So you, we choose only a few points of generic algorithm, and we, those are the, the dark dots. They are the generic algorithm results. Okay, we randomly pick a few points. 
Another another way, and those coins pretty quickly gather around the two bread set. Then we use very big boxes to cover those coins. Okay. Then we do the simple set mapping in the box. Then once we identify the bread set in the in the big box, we do the subdivision. You see the yellow one are the smaller cells. Then we do another level of the dominance test and the, and the local search. Essentially, we're going to throw away many, many little boxes. You are soon found out that only a few cells gathering along this that solid line becomes the parameter set. So that's, this is essentially uh, the way this hybrid algorithm works. So we start out with a bunch of random points generated by a generic algorithm, but they are all nearby the parameter set. And then we do the, the covering set of the boxes. Then we, in the box, we do the set mapping and we, we identify the, the parental set in the, in the very coarse way. And then we subdivide them. We can keep subdividing them easily because many cells eventually are thrown out. If you do the dominance test, okay, they are no longer part of the solution. So, so that band, yellow band, the next iteration becomes very narrow. One more iteration is gone, it's almost like a line. So that's in the, in the design space, in the objective space for the thread of run, you can see the hybrid method tends to generate a very evenly spaced solution. This is one of the goals uh, in optimization community. They always want to find evenly spaced uh, solution in the thread of run. So the the static based thing but naturally handles uniform solutions. So this is a very simple illustrative example. So you can roughly see how it works. And it's very efficient. I, I don't have this CPU time for this, it's only a fraction of a second anyway. Uh, but let me show you some other examples, the more challenging examples. So what we're gonna do, we we'll essentially compare uh, quite a few examples. So we, we use the GA alone, and we use the simple set mapping alone, but then we're actually sweeping the whole design space. Okay? Then we implement the hybrid method. We work on the benchmark problem. They are not very high dimensional. Uh, the high dimensional problem I showed you at the end will be uh, done in parallel okay? so, so here are the benchmarks or the, the criteria for Comparator. So we count how many function evaluations involved. This is very typical in organization studies. Uh, then the CPU time, how much time you actually use to find that solution. And then the accuracy of the solution. Like we are using this cost of dimension to measure the gradual set and the gradual front. Okay? Uh, because we are using benchmark problems, we know the solutions for, for those problems. Therefore, you can you can judge the accuracy of your numerical solution using the cost of dimension. So those are the three uh, indices we use to judge the accuracy, uh, the judge the quality, efficiency of the aggregate. So the number of function generations, the CPU time, and the accuracy of the parameter sets is the cost of dimension. So we we actually. Uh, run the GA algorithm many times, okay, the multiple GA runs and generate certain statistics. Then, then we say which method is good, which method is bad. So this is this is the basis for the comparative study. This is one of the famous uh, benchmark problem from SECA problem. Okay? So it's a two objective function with very long linear loop of the functions. And this function it is it in general n dimensional and you can you can scale this number from two to any number you like. Okay, we chose three in this in this talk. Uh, we can easily go up to uh, 16, 20, which I showed you later. This this example example was done in Maryland, so it takes a longer time, but then otherwise uh, uh, the comparison is fair. We're using the same computer using the same, same software. So this is a parental set and the parental from. This is a three-dimensional space. Therefore, the, the parental set is actually a two-dimensional manifold in that three-dimensional space. And likewise, the parental from is also uh, a one-dimensional manifold. 
embedded in a two-dimensional space. So you can see the, the red dots are essentially the hybrid methods that gives you the predator crop and the predator set. They are all there. And what's important is the, or the metrics, uh, the quantitative, uh, quantitative values. Okay, those are the number of divisions we use. We even do some divisions if we use CMF method. Uh, those are the CPU time. Remember, we are using MATLAB implementation, so it's not very fast. Okay, so for example, the hybrid method actually it takes like seven seconds uh, on average. Function variations are about the same, and then the most of dimensions is substantially improved uh, with the hybrid method. Essentially, <laughs> when you say that we about the same effort for this particular problem, uh, hybrid method gives a uh, a better accuracy. Uh, this is another benchmark problem. Uh, so also two objective functions, very complicated functions, and then uh, two design parameters, x and y. So let me just quickly go through the pictures. This one has an interesting uh, result. It has actually two branches in, in, the, in the design space, the predator set. So there's one here, one here. Correspondingly, the predator front also has two segments. At this point, okay. Now, if you want to translate this back to the dynamics of this particular system, uh, if we imagine that this happens to be the steady state response of the system uh, with two independent, separate, uh, disjoint steady state solutions, which sort of implies that the dynamics of the system is actually highly complicated. But it is very complicated because if you start Using this kind of functions to construct even the gradients, you will see the dynamics is really troublesome. Uh, again, I uh, have very similar results here. The function evaluation, the CPU time, and also the the host of dimension for accuracy. Now you notice that the host of dimension for this problem is a little bit partly because you have two branches. So the host host of dimension actually take both branches is one set. So the distance from one branch to another branch can be very large. Okay? Uh, but since we do this for all the methods consistently, it doesn't matter uh, how big the numbers are. But overall, the hybrid method still has an improvement. So this is another example, also pretty complicated. Uh, again, if you imagine that you are using the gradient search to, to form the gradient and do the global search, is really troublesome. Okay, now we again do a three dimensional example. This really just goes like I'm about this for. Uh, we can go for very high dimensional problem easily. So this one uh, in the present set, so there are actually quite a few branches. So you have one big branch, two, three, and there's a very thin line of present set and this isolated one. Okay, that's uh, again, this is a mathematical problem, by the way. Uh, uh, the ability to identify that point simply tells you the ability of the method to discover global solutions, all possible pieces of the solution. So the hybrid method actually found that one. Okay, uh, uh, so all together five branches in, in, in the credit set. Uh, that's three branches, four branches actually in the credit front. So these are the, the curves. Then actually it's not easy to get, okay? So, so and then again I have the, the CPU and also the cost of dimension showing the improvement stuff. So let's go to one engineering problem. Now, I have many done, but I only brought this one. And even this one, a lot of the students they have trouble understanding. So they are the second year electronics students. I, I, I can understand. So this is the pre lecture for you of course, after the conference, okay, about the linear control. So we have a second order linear system. This can be a three mass oscillator. It can also be a LC circuit, if you like, okay, if you if you are more on the electrical side. And then we have a control. This guy could be a force, or could be a voltage driving your LC circuit. And then we have designed the classical PID controller. And PID, then you're going to start this again. And the D, Controller doesn't have the reference arm here, this is the only thing I have to point out. So 
So we don't take derivative of the reference intervals in general when we do practical implementation. We don't do the derivative because the reference input, the R can be uh, non-differentiable. So the question here is, uh, what kind of case we should choose so that this controls closed loop system has the best step response function, best in the sense, I, I didn't list the objective functions here, I'm sorry, but the best in the sense that it, it has a very fast price, but a minimum overshoot and very small tracking error, the integrated tracking error. So three indices we want to achieve. And for second order system like this, typically the rise time and the overshoot are opposite to each other. If you one goes up, uh, one say that the rise time becomes more than the overshoot goes up, and vice versa. So usually they are, they are in conflict. So we are now trying to design the PID controller uh, in this parameter domain that we are fixing the range of the gains. You can choose any range, okay? This actually can come from your practical consideration because this more or less shows uh, or, or relates to how big you have, how amplified it is, or how big your shape is. So this is the result. So in the in the practical space, those are the practical sets. This is a three-dimensional object, so I project that onto a two-dimensional space. So there are actually many points over there. So it's very hard for you to see this. Uh, so this is the objective functions. So we use peak time to replace the the rise time. The peak, peak time and rise time are closely related. So when the, when the response shoots maximum for the first time, <laughs> and it's actually very close to, to the rise time. So we use the peak time and the, also the, the overshoot as well as the integrate absolute value uh, tracking error, three indices. So we project this into three, uh, two dimensional spaces again. But one thing I want to point out as compared to many mathematical benchmark optimization problems, this is a real engineering problem. It actually shows a very clear pattern in the practical problem. This idea was not usually observed uh, uh, in many mathematical problems. So that must be a good reason why that's a nice pattern. So then I'll show you the time domain response. This is, this is actually what I'm trying to design for. Uh, there are three extreme cases I've found here. Uh, the first one is for the minimum uh, peak time, so it goes up very fast. And then the next one is uh, minimum overshoot. So that's the green dash line, that's this guy. It doesn't have much overshoot. And then the, the minimum integrate tracking error, the absolute tracking error actually is, is the middle one. Usually the integration gives you the best compromise. If you have a good control design, the integrated index usually is somewhere in the middle. So those are actually the three extreme cases in our framework. So in that game range in the, for, for the control design, uh, all possible step responses will be essentially by enclosed by the envelope of those three curves. So that's very interesting. If you pick any game in the design and you do the step response, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, but that's, that's just an observation for linear systems. For non-linear systems, it may not be true. Okay, and some other technologies are maybe better than the extreme cases. Uh, so again, you can, I don't have the, the true compact. Uh, also, we just use another very fine solution as a basis to do the uh, accuracy validation. Uh, we have the CPU time stuff. You can remember this actually is a man-led implementation. It's kind of slow. Okay. The next one, I have many examples, but uh, let's just show you one and we we'll conclude. Uh, this one is actually implemented in parallel computing. Is, uh, is one of the family of benchmark examples. It's called the ZPT3. It's from one to six, I think, that six different problems. It has two objective functions. <coughs> uh, and the second one is kind of strange looking. And uh, this G function is one that allows you to scale the problem up and down. So we actually choose 
n equal to 13 can be okay uh, this is a this is a, uh, the thread of from I didn't show you the I don't have the thread of set yet uh, uh, if you are in the literature you can see this uh, this, this actually has a, a series of thread uh, from also a series of thread of set okay uh, we, we actually did this this again the 13 dimensional space in the end you know, we did some division here in the end the resolution of the cell space is 135 so essentially from 0 to 1 um, actually not zero, uh, for the x domain I don't have the range here but I think it is 0 to 1 we have 135 divisions but we actually don't do that up front we do the subdivision only on the random set so this this is the picture of at the front. So this is pretty high dimensional thing. Uh, the problem dimension is 30 by two. The 30 x and two objective functions. And the GPU time by using GPU for rather than computing on the laptop, only 300 cores or so. It's only like three or four seconds. So it's pretty fast. Uh, this is a, a generic class uh, mapping hybrid approach. Although it's a very high dimensional space, but the generic algorithm provides a few clusters of points in the gravel set, in the gravel space. Uh, then we, we take those points and we do the local recovery search. Then we got this solution pretty fast. We can have more points, by the way. We, we, we just stop here because this result was generated only yesterday. I, I wanted to show this. The people, some more time they can they can create more uniform distribution. So to conclude, uh, we just to say like any other professors doing the talk, my stuff is better usually as M talks pointless. So so our approach, the hybrid method, does have certain advantages. Okay, in, in all the cases that we started, we we do see better efficiency, better accuracy. And it's more likely to obtain local solutions because we are doing this uh, recovery search, even though.